Well, we're currently in a series called Good News. Say good news. You know, with all of the bad news that we're hearing, I thought it would be refreshing to hear some good news. Now, this past Sunday, I made four statements about the bad news. The first thing I said, I said the bad news is exaggerated. Exaggerated. You know, things tend to get blown out of proportion. Would you agree? I also said that the bad news is exploited. You know, people exaggerate the bad news so they, they can exploit others because fear sells. And uh, fear is easily marketed. I also said that the bad news is exhausting. You know, when bad news follows bad news, when follows bad news, it can wear you out. Fourth statement that I made last Sunday was the bad news is exposed. So, so last Sunday, I exposed the bad news. I did that by making these three statements. The first statement I made last Sunday was this on that, and that is the bad news is not all bad. Yeah, the bad news is not all bad. God can help us get some good even out of the bad. Second thing I said was the bad news can make you better make you better. It's often the lessons that we learn in the hard times that helps to grow us, mature us, and helps knock off some of the rough edges. Finally, I said the bad news can bring us closer to the Lord. Bad news can drive us to our knees, and that's exactly what it ought to do, drive us to our knees. And as we are driven to our knees, we are driven into the presence of the Lord. If you haven't heard this message, I encourage you to go online and listen to it. I believe it will be a blessing to you. Well, today I want to continue our series by making six statements about the good news. Six statements about the good news. First statement I want to make is this. Don't expect the good news to come automatically. Now, you know what? Usually the second service outdoes the first service, but man, the first service was on this morning, and right now you're kind of behind. So, uh, come on. You don't want to get beat by the first service, right? All right. So, I'm going to say it again. Don't expect the good news to come automatically. Amen. See, see, Jesus never promised to make your life easy or to hand you everything you ever wanted on a silver platter. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24 says, work hard and you'll become a leader. Be lazy and you'll become a slave. Proverbs 21 and 5 says, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. See, see, people look, uh, tend to look at others and, and, and sometimes envy others' positions or, or become jealous of their possessions, but, but they have absolutely no clue about how much effort or how much sacrifice that it took them to get where they are and to have what they have. Here's what I've learned. Good things seem, seem to happen to people who make good decisions. Would you agree? I'm going to say it again. Good things seem to happen to people who make good decisions. Now, I understand that bad things happen to good people sometimes, but I also know that we can set ourselves up for good things to happen to us. We do this by making good, wise, strategic decisions. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 8 says, the wise understand where they are going. And in verse 15 it says, only simpletons believe everything they're told. The wise carefully consider their steps. So, so don't expect good things to come automatically. Set yourself up for good things to happen to you by making good decisions. Don't just fly by the seat of your pants and then expect good news to come knocking at your door. It's probably not going to happen. Do the work. Yeah. Say, do the work. do the work. Yeah, do the work. Put in the time. Pay your dues. Let me help you this morning. Set yourself up for success. To set yourself up uh, for good things to come knocking at your door. Four things right here. Write these down. Number one, become competent. If you want good things to start happening and good news to start knocking on your door, first of all, become competent. And then after you become competent, number two, become confident. Become confident. And then number three, become committed. 
And then number four, become consistent. I'm going to give those to you again. Become competent, become confident, become committed, and become consistent. If you'll do these four things, good things, I believe, will start happening to you. Good news will begin, begin to knock on your door. Would you agree with me this morning? So don't expect good news to come automatically. Second thing I want to say about good news is this. Don't, don't fail to examine the good news. Don't fail to examine the good news. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 16 says, wise people think before they act. Here's the thing. Sometimes what appears to be good isn't quite as good as it appeared at first. Yeah. Have you ever experienced that? Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 says, there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. So don't fail to examine the good news because sometimes it's not as good as it first appears. Several years ago, a young father came to me for advice. This, this man was a young man. This man was married. This man had three little kids and, and he came to me uh, for advice. His company had offered him double pay, double pay if he would go overseas and work. He would be gone for 30 days overseas, then he would come home for 30 days, then he would go back overseas for 30 days, then he would come back for 30 days. And that would be his ongoing schedule, 30 days overseas, 30 days at, at home. And the pay had him convinced that he ought to go. And he came to me for advice. Don't come to me for advice if you don't want to get advice. And he came to me for advice. And he told me about the situation. And I said to him, I said to him, it's not about, it's not all about the pay. It's not all, sir. It's not all about the pay. And, and it wasn't the fact that he was, you know, that he couldn't make a living. This man was an engineer, okay? He made really good money already. It wasn't like he needed to take on this in order to be able to feed his family because they, they need, no, he was already making really good money. And I told him, I, I said, it's not all about the pay. I said, it's about what it will truly cost you what it will truly cost you. I said, you will miss half of your kid's life. If you say yes to this, you will miss half of your kid's life. 30 days, every, you know, you'll be gone half of the time overseas. You're going to miss half of your kid's life. And I said, your wife will have to do 100% of the parenting half of the time. I said, I said, I said, wait until the kids are grown. I said, you're a young man. I said, your kid, your last kid will be out of the house and you'll still be in your early 40s. You'll still be a young man. I said, wait until the kids are grown and, and, and do something like this. And he listened to me, right? Of course not. He really didn't want advice. He really wanted me to rubber stamp what he wanted to do. No, no, no. No, he ignored my advice. And that was okay. That was his business. But, but he was asking my opinion. And so he ignored my advice. The money got him. Well, several years later, I'd, I'd already left that city. He had already wasn't living there anymore. Several years lady, later, he, he made a point to come. And he made an appointment with me, and he came to see me. And he said to me, he said, Pastor, I wish I had listened to you. He said, going was a big mistake. Listen, don't fail to examine the good news. Sometimes what appears to be good isn't quite as good as it appears at first. Third thing I want to say this morning, my third statement is this. Don't express your good news to everyone. Don't express your good news to everyone. This is the mistake that Joseph made, right? You know the story of Joseph, and that's the story that Joseph made. Remember Joseph's dream? Remember, he had this dream, and in this dream, he saw his father and his brothers bowing down to him. He saw himself as a ruler. He saw himself in charge. He saw himself in control, and he literally saw his father and his brothers bowing down to him. And he told them about this dream. Not a good move, Joseph. 
Not a good move. Here's what you need to know. Some people aren't mature enough to handle your good news. Some people will become jealous of you and your good news. Some people will begin to be intimidated by you because of the good news. Sometimes they will even begin to criticize you and even disassociate with you. Has this ever happened to you? It's happened to me. It's happened to me. Many years ago now, I was sought out by and then elected to a church that was three times larger than the one that I was pastoring at the time. I had not pursued them. They pursued me. Two things happened. A good friend of mine, or at least I thought he was a good friend of mine, started ghosting me and started treating me bad when he did see me. He would do everything in his power not to see me, to avoid me, but even if we were to bump into each other, he was rude to me, he was not kind to me, he treated me ugly. Well, I later found out he wanted that church and was jealous of me because I got it. Second thing that happened is that, is that I walked in on a couple of pastors at a pastor's conference. I, I stepped into the restroom, and when I opened the door, I heard my name. And so I just stood at the door and listened. And there were two pastors at that conference in the restroom, and they were talking about me. And in that conversation, they were talking about how I wasn't qualified to pastor a church that size. Why did they call Benson? I don't know why they called him. He's not qualified to pastor a church like that. I, I was in my early 30s. Well, you should have seen the look on their face when they saw me and realized I had heard everything that they had said. May I, may I just say they left the men's room in record speed. See, some people are not mature enough to handle your good news, so don't express your good news to everyone. See, see, most people can handle your bad news. They can handle your bad news. But very few people can handle your good news. The Bible says to weep with those that are weeping and rejoice with those that are rejoicing. Well, I've discovered that people are a whole, it's a whole lot easier for people to weep with you when you're weeping. Man, they will get down and wallow with you. They're just glad it's you and not them. And they're good to give you a shoulder to cry on. They, it's easy to weep with those that are weeping, but it's a whole lot harder to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. All right, the fourth thing. I want to say the fourth statement I want to make about the good news is this. Don't allow your excitement of the good news to cause you to react too quickly. Proverbs 14 and 16 says, the wise are cautious. Fools plunge ahead with reckless confidence. And then Proverbs 19 and 2 says, enthusiasm without knowledge is not good. Haste right. makes mistakes. Somebody said, if it sounds too good to be true, it, it probably is. Back to point number two, sometimes what appears to be good isn't quite as good as it first appeared. But sometimes, sometimes it is true, but it's not time. See, see God's will and his timing are two different things. Just ask David, just ask Joseph. David was anointed king, but, but approximately 15 years transpired before he took the throne. That's a lot of time. And it was approximately 14 years between Joseph's dream and his dream coming true. Somebody here this morning needs to hear this. Maybe you have received a promise from the Lord. Maybe, maybe God has promised you something and you've received a promise from the Lord. God has given you some good news, perhaps good news about your future, but absolutely nothing has happened. In fact, in fact, things have gotten worse. 
Can you even imagine what David and what Joseph must have felt when, when, when Joseph was forgotten in prison uh, and David was running for his life from Saul? Both of these have great, great things happening. They've received good news, man. Good news is waiting on them, and yet, and yet nothing is happening. In fact, what is happening, it is all bad. Year after year after year, their good news was not coming about. But if you've read the stories, you know that God was faithful, right? God was faithful in his time. In his time, God made it happen. And I've got some good news for you this morning, even though it hasn't happened yet, and maybe even things have gotten worse in your life. But I promise you this morning that if you have a promise from God, if God has promised you something, I'm telling you that God will make good on his promise. I'm not saying it'll happen tomorrow or next week or even next year, but I'm telling you that God will make good on his promise. I love what Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 says. Paul writes, and he says, don't, don't get tired of doing what is right. <laughs> but we do, don't we? Yeah, we do, don't we? Get, we get tired sometimes of doing what's right. But he says, don't get tired of doing what, what is right. He said, J at just the right time. Say, just the right time. Because at just the right time, Paul says, you will reap a harvest of blessing. But he adds this, if you don't give up. Hear me this morning, if God has truly given you a promise, he will fulfill his promise to you, amen? Oh, but it will be in his time. It will be in his time, not in our time, but it'll be in his time. But here's what I've learned about God's time, and that is God's time is always the right time. Doesn't always feel that way, doesn't always look that way, but it is, it is. The fifth statement I want to make about the good news this morning is this. Don't think that the good news will exempt you from any bad news. Yeah, don't think that the good news will exempt you from any bad news. Did God pick David to be Israel's next king? Absolutely. That's some pretty good news, right? Listen, listen, I wouldn't mind being crowned King Mike. That's some pretty awesome news. You're going to be... You're going to be the king, and especially, especially when you're a shepherd boy, when you get to promise. Right, right. Did God give Joseph a dream about becoming a great leader and being in charge? Did he? Yeah. Absolutely. That's some pretty incredible news also. But hear me, just because these two guys got some good news, that did not exempt them from any bad news. In fact, they both had more than their share of bad news that followed their good news. There's a phrase that is repeated over and over and over in the story of Joseph. I challenge you to go home and read the story of Joseph. It is an incredible, incredible story. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. But there's a phrase that is repeated over and over in the story of Joseph in the Bible. And the phrase is, and the Lord was with Joseph. And the Lord was with Joseph. The Bible says that, that his brothers threw him in a pit. But the Bible says, but the Lord was with Joseph. The Bible says that Joseph was, was put into prison, but it says, but the Lord was with Joseph. Oh, read the story and you'll find whether he was in the pit or whether he was in the prison or whether he was in the palace, the Lord was with Joseph. And I want to tell you this morning, wherever you are in your life, maybe you're in the pit today. Maybe you're in prison today. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know this morning, but wherever you are, I promise you that the Lord is with you. He's with us. He's with us. Amen. See, see, it's not just about our predicament. It's also about the person that's in the predicament with us. And that person's name is, is Jesus. Remember the story in the Bible of the three Hebrew children. There were Shadrach, Meshach, and under the bed we go. <laughs> Ricky Lewis said, I love that this morning. I never heard that. I said, it's so old and it's new. You know the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember the story that, that they were not to bow to the king's image. Remember the story that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew that they were not to bow to any other God than the true and the living God, and they refused to bow. And because they refused to bow, they were thrown into a fiery furnace, a furnace of fire. Of fire. 
Not for doing something wrong, but for doing the right thing. They were God's peeps doing God's work, but they were punished for it. But here's the point I'm making, and that is they didn't have to go into the fiery furnace alone. They didn't have to go into the furnace alone. Somebody was already in there waiting on them when they got there. And King Nebi asked his counselors, he said, did we not cast three men into the fire? And they recounted, yes, there was Shadrach and there was Meshach and there was Abednego. But the king says, but look, I see four men. There's Shadrach, there's Meshach, there's Abednego, and there's somebody else. And he has the form of the, four, of, of the Son of God. I'm telling you this morning, no matter how hot the fire might be in your life, no matter how hot the furnace may be turned up in your life, I'm telling you that the fourth man is in the fire with you today. Jesus is there. He's there to walk with you. He's there to take your hand. He's there to protect you. And listen, listen, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got out of the fire, the Bible said they didn't even, even have any smoke, didn't even smell like smoke. That's the protection of the Lord. And, he, and God loves you as much as he loves Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. The simple truth of the matter is this. Life is a series of both good and bad news. But the good news is God is faithful in both, right? He's faithful in both. All right, let's look at the sixth and the final statement that I want to make about the good news, and it's this. Don't allow the good news to turn you into an extremist. Now, I should have said it this way. Don't allow the good news or the bad news to turn you into an extremist. See, it is human nature to develop tunnel vision, right? Tunnel vision. If that, that, that's just human nature. Tunnel vision is to focus exclusively on a single point of view, to become narrow-minded, to close one's mind to any other thought or opinion but one's own. We're seeing a lot of this these days, are we not? Seeing a lot, you're afraid to say amen, amen. I said we're seeing a lot of this today, right? See, see, we have optimists and we have pessimists. You know, there are those that can only see the bad. Gloom and doom everywhere. And then there are those who can only see the good. You know, they look at life through rose-colored glasses. Both of these are extremes. Both of these are extremes. In Romans chapter 5 and chapter 6, Paul writes about the good news of grace. How many are thankful for the good news of grace? Oh, it's some fabulous news. The good news of grace. And Paul writes there about how wonderful that grace is and how marvelous and how awesome that, that grace is, how incredible grace is. And he says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, he says, listen, he says where sin abounds, he says grace abounds even more. He says, you want to talk about the bad news. You want to talk about the bad days. You want to talk about all of the bad and all the evil and all the wickedness that is in the world. But Paul says, even no matter how wicked and how vile and how bad that sin is and how ugly that it is, but grace uh, and, 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 and sin abounds everywhere. But Paul says, but grace abounds even more, even more, even more. Paul says where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. But Paul recognized the fact that extremists could take this doctrine too far. And how many know that some people do today? They take the doctrine of grace too far. And Paul recognized the fact that extremists would take this doctrine too far. They would make grace a license to sin. And so because Paul recognized the fact that extremists could take this doctrine too far, he writes in chapter 6 in verse number 1, he says, So shall we keep on sinning so that grace can abound? Man, you know, sin shows how incredible grace is. So, so shall we just keep on sinning and sinning and sinning so that grace can keep on abounding and abounding and abounding and abounding? And he answers his own question and he says, God forbid. God forbid. We need to be careful lest we become an extremist by developing tunnel vision. Whether we become an extremist with the good news or the bad news. During the pandemic, we experienced extremists on both sides of the fence, right? There was extreme fear and there was extreme faith. There was extreme inclusion and there was extreme exclusion. Here's what I've come to believe. A balanced life is the best life. 
A balanced life is the best life. When I was a young pastor, my wife and I got married. You've heard this story a thousand times. Some of you have never heard it because it's your first time here. But my wife and I got married at the age of 17 and became lead pastors at 17. Can you imagine the wisdom that just oozed from the podium every Sunday morning? You can be thankful. You know, people, people say, man, I'd love to hear you preach in those days. No, you would not. And I am so thankful that nobody uses cassette tapes anymore. Because I got thousands of cassette tapes out there. I, I, I traveled for a few years and I sold thousands or at least yeah, thousands of those cassette tapes. And they're ever, thank God they don't have them anymore. Amen. And when I was a young pastor, one of the things that I preached was this. No, I'm not having a heart attack. I'm okay. My phone's checking on me. But when I was a young preacher, I preached this. I preached, I preached, live on the edge. Live on the edge. And I said to the people, I said, if you don't live, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. You need to live on the edge. How dumb was that? How dumb was that? And they shouted me down. Today I preach, live life with margin. Give yourself some space because a balanced life is the best life. Remember the old story about the the man that needed to hire a chauffeur. He lived up in the mountains and he needed a chauffeur to pick him up and take him places. And so he, he was trying to hire a chauffeur and, and so he had three applicants. And he brought those three applicants together and he said to them, he says, he says, I lived up on top of this mountain and those are winding narrow roads. And he said, I want to know how close to the edge of that mountain could you get me in my car? And one guy, man, I mean, he just says, man, I could get you within, I could get you within two feet of the edge of that mountain. I'm a good driver, man. And the next guy said, well, <laughs> two feet, I could, I could get you within a foot of the edge of that mountain. The third guy didn't say anything. So the man looking for the chauffeur, he asked the third man, said, well, what about you? He said, well, sir. He said, I've seen your car, and it's nice. And he said, I know that you are a very important man. So he said, I'll tell you, sir, I'd do my best to keep you as far away from the edge of that mountain as I possibly could. I wonder who got the job that day. No, we don't need to live out on the edge. You know, you're out on the edge, man, one little bobble, and you're over, Right? You're over. Give yourself some margin. Give yourself some margin. The, the takeaway for the message this morning is this. God uses both the good news and the bad news to fulfill his purpose in our lives. See, I can't promise you that you won't have any bad news. I can actually promise you that you will. But even though I can't promise you that all of life will only be a bunch of good news, and if you love Jesus, all you'll ever get is good news, I can't promise you that, but I can promise you that whether you get good news or whether you get bad news, you won't be facing it alone. There's somebody that wants to walk beside you and hold your hand and see you 